So this is the presentation that we gave on Friday, March 2nd at our investor day. This is our disclaimer. So our value proposition to our investors is that we want to build a concentrated portfolio of superior businesses that can outperform the market over the long term. So concentrated means that we want to have a handful of great businesses. So typically our portfolio will range something around 20 securities and our top 10 positions will be above 70% of the fund. Uh, and long term means a multi-year uh, period. Ideally, we want to hold businesses for a very long period of time. We're very tax sensitive. We, wanna, we don't want to have to sell. We just want to compound our capital for a long period of time. And we're, we're not market timers. We don't trade in and out. We don't think of these things as pieces of paper. We think of, uh, of them rather as, as businesses that we own and that are part of our, uh, our family's endowment. So uh, it's as if we owned a private business. That's how we think of, of the securities uh, that we own, which are pieces of, of fantastic businesses. Uh, another one of our key core values is continuous learning and adaptation. The world is changing very, very quickly, as we'll see, and many business models are becoming obsolete. And we invest our, our money alongside yours. About 20%, um, something around 20 to 24% of the capital of the fund is family money. So myself, my wife, and, and my, my family. Uh, so we are heavily incentivized to manage our risk appropriately and to, uh, to look for situations where we can dramatically outperform as well. So our mission really is to provide our investors with institutional quality investment excellence. So our edge is, uh, we have many sources of, of edge, if you will. Uh, one of them is analytical. So we have a superior search strategy. Finding those investments, gathering and processing information is a key part of our, of our, um, uh, of our process. Uh, behavioral, so continuous learning, as I said, seeking disconfirming evidence for theses, not uh, falling into the trap of only looking at information that confirms uh, your prior prior uh, biases and, and uh, first conclusion bias uh, and, and information that confirms your thesis. So you have to keep searching for disconfirming information uh, uh, con continuously. Uh, client alpha, very important. So we have investors who have been with us since day one, and I never get calls. Our investors are very, very long-term minded. And in fact, when the market is down and we have a, uh, a, a down month or a down period, we frequently get calls from investors adding, asking to add more money to the fund, which is exactly what people should be doing. Uh, people should be buying when when there is uh, when, when there are uh, temporary uh, uh, drawdowns in the market because uh, we are buying a, a piece a pieces of fantastic businesses that will perform very well over time. And, and finally, organizational edge. This is very important. So we have all the incentives and processes set up in a way to maximize investment excellence in terms of uh, in terms of the incentives of the manager and and the fact that I can focus you know, 99% of my time on research and talking to companies, traveling, uh, discovering new investments and analyzing our current investments. Active beats passive. So I, I think this is very, very critical today and probably more so in the future. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of business models are becoming obsolete as we'll see. And a passive index is not going to go to the Amazon Web Services conference. That's the photo on the top left. Um, to uh, that's forty three thousand developers to figure out what's happening in in the cloud business and how that's going to change the world. Your passive index is not going to visit China to learn about the beer industry there. That's the Carlos Brito, the CEO of Anheuser Busch, and your 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 index is not going to go and try new computing platforms like the Oculus Rift in the Facebook campus in Silicon Valley. So uh, this active involvement, I feel, is more critical than ever. And, you know, tech is everywhere. So this is a, a photo of a Google self-driving car. 
later this year in 2018 in the summer um, in Phoenix, Google will actually have its own commercial ride hailing business through its Waymo subsidiary, whereby anyone will be able to hail a self-driving car with no human driver. And that's going to be the first of its kind in the U.S. And so I feel that a lot of managers have the blinders on and are investing in the world of yesterday. Uh, As we'll see, more and more business models are becoming impacted by technology. It used to be that technology was a backwater. It was uh, enterprise only. It didn't really touch the consumer. Today, it's extraordinarily consumerized. Technology is in everybody's fingertips. So being aware of that, understanding the technology, how it's changing, what's coming uh, down the the pike and, and how that's going to impact everything, I think is is a skill that is increasingly important. And that's something that we do very well at Heller House. Um, I wanted to focus on this slide for a second. So uh, the battle for the customer interface, this was posted in 2015. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something interesting is happening. And of course, since then, a lot of these things have changed. Now those companies are doing those things that they weren't doing back then. But the point still stands. How is it possible that these startups came out of seemingly nowhere and took over industries that had been around for such a long time. So before we try to understand what's happening, a little bit of context is uh, is critical. This is a picture of technological S-curves. So these are curves of technology adoption and diffusion. And if you go back in time, we've had several of these waves, uh, starting with Lumen Textiles in the 1700s and then steam and rail, oil and mass production, and now computing and digital. And we're here at the beginning of this incredible S-curve of computing and digital. And what happens is these technological innovations, as they diffuse and form this pattern of the S-curve, over time, they generate enormous wealth. So this is what has propelled world economies and has propelled individual wealth over this time period. So the first wave was canals in, in the 1700s, and it was uh, there were canal manias, people raising lots of money to go build canals, a lot of speculative, uh, a big speculative frenzy to build out. It was a revolution in transportation. This was followed, obviously, by the railroads in the 1800s, and then steel and steam. This is a picture of a of a steam engine. People would bring their family to go and observe the incredible steam engine made out of steel. And around this time, of course, electricity also uh, was was invented. Uh, and then uh, the fourth wave was oil and cars. This is a Ford Motor Company assembly line. And finally, the fifth wave, which we're living in now, which is computers. This is the Fairchild Semiconductor Company uh, inventing the semiconductor. And what these S-curves create is this incredible wealth. This is a picture of world GDP. You can see since the year one until roughly the 1600s, uh, there was nothing. There was no wealth. All we had was you know, muskets and perhaps uh, the wheel. And uh, we, we didn't really have motive power. We didn't really have uh, 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 these fantastic tools that we discovered in the Industrial Revolution. And But when we did, look what happens to GDP. It just completely goes off the charts and rises exponentially. And this will continue. This is the fundamental process of technological innovation. And as investors in businesses, we are capturing a piece of this exponential growth in GDP. So this is the the fundamental process. There, Claudia Perez is a uh, an economist that specializes in, in this kind of work. And she's identified the various points of, of the S-curve. So it starts out in this lower bottom gestation period where things feel like they're not really changing very fast, right? It just feels like you know, technology is clunky. It doesn't work very well. Everything's going very slowly. And then you have this eruption phase where it starts getting more adoption. And then there's like a, a frenzy. Think of this as a, uh, a huge um, uh, uh, 
speculative phase, dot com uh, bubble, now perhaps a cryptocurrency bubble, and then there's a turning point which leads to mass adoption. And then these periods are roughly 20 to 30 years, installation and deployment. Uh, and towards the end, you get maturity. The, the technologies uh, are, are fairly, fairly mature and not changing very much. And then, of course, along comes another S-curve towards the bottom right of, of the chart, and, and the cycle continues again. So let's uh, talk about the consumer a little bit, because the consumer is 70% of GDP and drives a lot of, of what we see in these S-curves. This is a photograph of, a, of an Apple store in China. Uh, these are incredible consumer products made by Apple that obviously uh, didn't exist even even a decade or two ago. Now, what's interesting is if you go back in the 1800s, we spent about 44% of our wallet for food, right? And today, we spend about 8% of our wallet for food. So what happened? Well, technology happened. It used to be that in the United States, uh, about 75% of the population would grow food for a population of 1.5 million people. So 75% of us were plowing the fields and back then, 1869, with very little in terms of, of machine help. Uh, fast forward to today, we have a population that is 330 million people, up from about a million and a half back then, but less than 3% of the population is needed to make food for everyone. And that's because uh, we have pesticides, we have incredible tractors uh, that ha that are GPS enabled, and we, we dramatically increase the productivity per acre of our farms. And that is all due to the rise of technology. So this freed up a lot of spending power. Uh, of course, food is one example. Other parts of our wallet were also freed up because of technology. And so about 59% of everything that we spend money on today uh, is for categories that didn't even exist in 1869. And this will continue. Again, this is the process of technology. It's massively deflationary. It makes things cheaper over time when that frees up spending power and wealth for consumers to spend in things that they didn't even know they needed. This is a bull market in non-necessities, if you will. This is from the BLS. Uh, you can see in 1901, we used to spend about 20% of our wallet in non-necessities, and now it's about half of our wallet in non-necessities. If we look at these S-curves, what's remarkable is that you don't really see a recession, you don't really see a war. These curves are incredibly smooth. So here you have curves for the automobile, the refrigerator, the radio, and the washing machine. And then there's some more here, running water, electricity, primary lighting, central heating, indoor flush toilet. You know, life used to really suck uh, many, many years ago because we didn't have uh, these things that today are we consider basic uh, utilities. Back then, this was all high tech. You know, at one point, all of these things were high tech. And, and again, here you don't see recessions. You don't really see a, a, a war. Uh, the adoption of, of these technologies is, is just so, uh, so strong. And this is another way to visualize this data. And as you can see, uh, something like the automobile on the top right, it, you know, it took a long time to get to 80% of the U.S. population because you really had to learn how to use these machines. There had to be all this infrastructure built, the highway system, gas stations, etc. Uh, so uh, it was it was difficult to adopt. Something like the electricity happened faster, and then as you see, like newer technologies. Uh, the the x-axis is, is years since invention. Television uh, took a lot less time to reach 80% and then 100% penetration. And then, of course, the newer technologies like the personal computer, cell phone, and internet are being adopted at a much faster pace. This is another way to visualize this data. As you can see, this is how many years it took for these technologies to reach 25% of the U.S. population. Electricity took 46 years. Television took 26 years, and the internet took seven, social media took five. So it's not your impression. The world is changing more quickly than, than it ever has. But of course, we don't want to invest in the primary technology. So this is a chart of automo automobile industry 
entries and exits. And over this time period, there were hundreds of firms that were created and destroyed. And then, of course, we're left with, uh, in the 40s, we were left with Chrysler, Ford, and GM. And then subsequently, Chrysler and GM went bankrupt and have been now out of bankruptcy. Uh, so it, it, even today, it's not a, uh, a it's not a really interesting industry, uh, and it's about to get disrupted again. But uh, the, the the point of this is, you don't necessarily want to invest in the primary technology. You want to invest in a derivative, something that has a moat. So you always have to be looking. We'll we'll talk about what that means. Uh, so the the key was not maybe to to buy cars. It was to buy it, it, and you could know by the way in the 40s that eventually we were going to have highways, and uh, and the interstate highway system. But you could not have forecast something like Walmart, which ended up being really the investment that that you wanted to make. Um, uh, it ended up being a very profitable investment. So this was sort of a, a third derivative of that automobile S curve adoption. So. We have to find, part of our framework at Heller House is finding investments that have moats. And and a moat uh, is essentially you have, uh, this is a photograph of, of, a, of a castle, and these castles used to have as protection against their enemies these these uh, moats of, of water around them. And in, in a capitalistic system, somebody's always trying to steer your business, not steer your business, but, but steer your customers uh, and attack your business competitively. Uh, and and figure out ways to to, to fight with you um, in 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 business. So you really want uh, you really want to be in a business that has enormous uh, competitive advantages and defenses. Another way to think about this is this concept of franchise, which is uh, a product or service that is needed or desired, is thought by its customers to have no close substitute, and is not subject to price regulation. And another interesting mental model or framework is this idea that the market is is very important. This is a concept from startup investing, but it also applies to us. So when you have a great team, but there's a lousy market, the market wins. When a lousy team meets a great market, the market also wins, right? In this case, in, in, in the case of startups, like a great market will pull product out of even a lousy team. But then finally, what you really want is a great team and a great market, and then you know magic happens. And you can tell when uh, when when there's uh, what you want to do is you want to create a product for this fantastic market and, and achieve product market fit. And you can tell when there's great product market fit. Your phone is ringing off the hook, cash is piling up on your on your bank account, and the uh, the investment bankers are staking out your front lawn. And on the other hand, you can tell when there's no product market fit. The sales cycle takes forever. Nobody returns your calls. Uh, and so we want to be in businesses that have a fantastic product, that are in a fantastic market, and that have a fantastic team. So putting these things together, what we're looking for is a valuable and large addressable market that meets an exceptional product that, that people need and love. So you have that product market fit. You want to be riding one or more of these technological S curves because that'll drive adoption of your product in that great market. And you want to have a business with a wide and defensible moat, a franchise. This creates the ability to innovate, reinvest, and grow, which is critical. And finally, of course, valuation is very important. So we want to do all this uh, in, in a business that we can buy at a sensible price. So to tie this back to an example that a lot of people watching this will be familiar with, uh, Benjamin Graham was uh, one of the greatest investors in the 20th century. Uh, uh, for those who who um, who follow the the philosophy of value investing, and he taught Warren Buffett. He was Warren Buffett's uh, professor at Columbia University, and Ben Graham ran an investment fund. And in 1948. He uh, he says, you know, I found this company called Geico. This is the same Geico that exists today, but back then it was a uh, publicly traded company. And I thought this company had good prospects. Uh, it was the stock was a little bit expensive, but we put about a, a fifth of our fund. And what's interesting is if you uh, a fifth of our fund in this stock, if you zoom out. And, and Ben Graham didn't know about S curves and, and all, and didn't have this framework. But if you zoom out, you can see that the automobile in 1948 was at about 50% adoption. 
uh, in terms of penetration uh, in U.S. households. So this was smack in the middle of, of a massive S curve that you knew was going in, in and you knew the automobile was going to get adopted more and more by, by households. Um, subsequent to this investment, you can see this is an incredible amount of miles driven. So how did he do? Well, Ben Graham made 145 times his money in 24 years, which is about a 23% compounded return. And uh, what's really interesting, this is from the Intelligent Investor, and he writes this, of course, many years later. He says, ironically enough, the aggregate profits from this one investment in Geico far exceeded the sum of everything else that, that we did in, in our fund uh, involving much investigation, endless pondering, and countless, countless individual decisions. So the key insight here is if you, if you can find uh, a business with these characteristics, uh, then, then just it, it, those are the best investments to make. And, and one additional point is Geico, it's about 30% cheaper than competing products because it's direct to consumer. And so, for example, State Farm Insurance was sold through agents. Geico also had a superior risk targeting because it, they targeted government employees, right? It's in the name, Government Employee Insurance Company. Uh, back then, there was no FICO score, no computer analytics, et cetera. So how do you find those customers that are less likely to ha get into car accidents? Well, they, they figured teachers, government employees, army vets, et cetera, were good targets. And so this was a superior product sold in a superior way with a superior risk uh, assessment of its of its customers, riding this phenomenal S curve, um, and when Ben Graham bought it, it w it was sort of expensive. You know, he talks about you know as soon as we bought it, the, the the multiple was a little bit higher than what we wanted to pay, but we thought it had great prospects, so we kept we kept the investment. So what we're doing at Heller House is we're packing the portfolio with Geico's. You know, we're just sort of. Going, skipping, skipping all the endless pondering, and just uh, packing the portfolio with these types of uh, businesses that have these types of characteristics. Now, of course, since that investment that Ben Graham made, this happened, right? This the internet in the early '90s, and this was uh, like all new technologies. It was clunky and difficult to use, and it really changed everything. So, what the internet did is it it took the distribution cost of digital goods to zero. And this is very critical, as we'll see. And it took the transaction cost to zero as well. Now, going back to the slide, what does that mean? Well, any consumer uh, business can be, uh, you can divide it into three parts, essentially the supply side, the suppliers, the distributors, and the end customer. So, for example, in a taxi company, the point of integration is between the suppliers, so the, the cars and the medallions. So the taxi company would integrate, they would either own or lease the cars, and they would integrate that with the taxi medallions. Uh, taxi medallions are monopolies essentially granted by the state or the, or the city uh, that would restrict the supply of cabs. And in places like New York City, these medallions can go for a million dollars. So that is the point of integration. And the point of integration is where you capture the value. What the internet did is it allowed the point of integration to shift. So Uber, for example, shifted the point of integration forward and captured value. And what they integrated was the distribution, right? They're in your, your hand through the app on your phone. Uh, the integrated payments, the integrated routing, the integrated uh, dispatch, and the, the, the customer, which used to be an afterthought in the previous uh, slide, is now front and center. So when you integrate closer to the customer and you own that customer relationship, uh, that is a, a great position to be in as a consumer business. And of course, what uh, Uber modularized or commoditized was the, the supplier side, so uh, the automobile. And this pattern, is something that repeats over and over again. So Airbnb commoditized trust, right? If you go to, you used to go to a Hyatt or a Marriott because you knew that the the brand uh, provided you with comfort as to the quality, uh, and that was integrated with the real estate. And Airbnb modularized all that, and 
shifted the point of integration closer to the customer. Google did the same thing. It modularized content, newspaper content initially, and integrated closer to the consumer. So this is a process that's been happening over and over again, uh, this process of aggregating consumers at scale and modularizing suppliers. So we can call these companies aggregators. And, and so this is the process that, that is enabled by, by the internet. When you squeeze one part of the value chain, the profits flow to another part of the value chain. This is called the law of conservation of attractive profits. It's kind of like a balloon toy where you squeeze one part and the air flows somewhere else. And another dynamic that's very interesting is this winner-take-all situation, which is enabled by the internet. So a great user experience for the consumer will attract more users to the product which then attracts more suppliers, right? Think of Uber. If you have a phenomenal user experience uh, and there are more people using the Uber app, there's going to be more drivers and vice versa. And this creates this incredible flywheel and a winner take all effect. So think about your traditional business before this process. If you wanted to sell, let's say, laundry detergent in the supermarket, you would put the product on the shelf and maybe it would get sold very easily by some people walking by the early adopters and then they would tell their friends about it but then it would become harder for you to reach that incremental customer to convince and convert that incremental customer to buy your laundry detergent so you had to maybe advertise um, and then after after a while the advertising became you sort of saturated so you had to go out and shout to a bigger audience so maybe you bought a super bowl commercial and all of that gets more expensive that's your customer acquisition cost it goes up uh the, the more the more your business grows uh what's interesting about these aggregators is that this gets inverted so as the size of the network and in, in the case of these companies that have network effects like uber and airbnb and google etc the bigger the size of the network and the better the network and the more users it has, the lower the customer acquisition cost because it's now, uh, it's now a better value proposition for that incremental customer to join the network. So if, if a lot of cars are on Uber and a lot of users are on Uber and it's a very liquid marketplace, it's much more likely that your mom or your grandma is going to choose Uber instead of, uh, instead of hailing a cab because there's going to be more cars available in that network than, than before. Um, so nearly every industry is going to find out that there is some sort of critical function that can be digitized or commoditized. So a couple weeks ago, I was at the Cagney conference uh, in Boca, and this is the conference for consumer packaged goods companies. So Kellogg and uh, General Mills, Unilever, Nestle, all these companies were there. And the general tone was uh, sort of depressed. That pe everybody was talking about disruption. Johnson & Johnson had the most... Uh, front and center slides about this topic. And so the slide before this in their presentation said, we are getting disrupted. And here they have a list on the left of everything that used to make them unique. And it created this, uh, the thing that used to make them a franchise, if you will. And then on the, on the, on the right, you have all the, the companies that have uh, disintermediated Johnson & Johnson to a certain extent. So it, they used to be able to source the best talent and have the best uh, brands uh, and advertising and, and, cha and channels to, to, to uh, sell to the, to the consumer. And now, of course, you have all of these businesses and services enabled by the Internet that have, uh, that have dramatically diminished the, the ability of Johnson & Johnson to do these things. So... With this in mind, with this process that's happening to a lot of companies, um, I wanted to talk about three aggregators, and, and these companies are aggregators to different extents um, that we have in our portfolio in Heller House that are taking advantage of this process of, of disruption, if you will, and of aggregating consumers at, at scale. So the first one, of course, is a company called Alphabet now, but it's the parent company of the search engine Google. So Google started really when uh, uh, you know bandwidth was still expensive the cheapest thing to to uh, to to transport over the internet was text and so newspapers started becoming unbundled and that's what Google did it sort of modularized these articles made them available through search and then Google knew more about you than anybody else at the time so it had rich profile data against which you could sell highly effective advertising 
And you can see this process happening uh, in the uh, in in the 2000s with the rise of of Google and the spread of the internet, where the advertising dollars this is advertising dollars for uh, for the newspaper industry just basically fell off a cliff. Now, what's interesting about this chart is in the early to mid 70s, Warren Buffett was going around the country looking for newspapers to buy because back then it, these were f absolute franchises they had defensible economic moats and buffett uh, would joke that if you had a dumb nephew you could you know let him run the newspaper because it was a license to print money think think about it back then if you wanted to get stock quotes and local news and uh, uh, worldwide news and and sports and classifieds and all these things there was really only one bundle that you could go to. Uh, there was very few TV channels. And so the newspaper was uh, just this phenomenally profitable bundle of, of information and entertainment. And, and of course, this shows why it's so important to, to, to look out for disruptors. So Google has this incredible uh, flywheel effect where the more people use the product, uh, the more data Google is able to collect, which improves its uh, the quality of, of the search and the quality of the results. And uh, and uh, the more and, and this also happens uh, given the more, the more websites are in the are in are in Google. Now websites actually want to be indexed by Google because everybody wants to be found. So this is a, a business where the suppliers actually want to be uh, on your service and they'll actually pay money to be on your service. And the other thing that's interesting about Google is it's, it has a self-service ad platform. So you can do business with Google and sell ads without ever talking to a human being. And uh, the other sort of S-curve that's happening right now is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And Google is at the forefront of this. They're running machine learning against all of this. And uh, most of the compute at Google is now running um, artificial intelligence, and that's growing. So it gives them uh, an additional layer of moat, if you will. So these are revenues for Google over the years. Uh, this is uh, quarterly revenues. And the the dark bar is uh, Google's own websites. The light uh, blue is uh, uh, third-party websites where Google sells its advertisements as well. Um, other bets are in green and then other revenues in orange. And this has been growing at a very, uh, very uh, uh, healthy rate. Uh, so just um, a fun exercise. Uh, there's some hidden value inside Google that we're really not paying for right now through through the stock through the stock price. So Netflix has about 100 million subscribers and it's valued in the stock market at about $130 billion. Uh, YouTube, which is owned by Google, has 1.5 billion viewers. Now this is very different business model because Netflix has a subscription uh, service. People pay anywhere from eight to 12, $13 a month. Uh, YouTube is advertising, advertising supported and they have to pay royalties to uh, music video providers, et cetera, and the folks who, who uh, uh, some of the professional creators. But it's interesting to think about what it could be worth. Um, I struggle to believe that YouTube is worth uh, less than, than Netflix. And, and that's sort of, you know, we're not really paying for that right now. Um, this is a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek example. It's probably too aggressive because of the, the margin assumption. But uh, it's sort of a, a rough estimate of what could be the case, perhaps if not today, then, then in the future of what YouTube could be worth. Uh, and if it's worth $300 billion, that would be about 63% of the enterprise value of Alphabet. It's you know probably worth uh, at least a third of that. Uh, so, so I think th this is, again, frosting on the cake. We're not really paying for it right now. Uh, and we're not hanging our head on it. It's just an interesting exercise. And just as a reminder, YouTube was acquired by Google for $1.65 billion in 2006. So this has really been a home run acquisition, regardless of how much it's worth right now, whether it's $300 billion or $100 billion or $50 billion. Now, the orange uh, revenues in uh, two slides ago, those include uh, Google Play and devices and the cloud. Now, the cloud revenues um, are, are pretty exciting. It's about a billion dollars 
quarterly right now, and it's been growing very, very fast. And we'll see in subsequent slides why this is so interesting. But this could be a huge business for, for Google, and it's uh, very profitable. Now let's talk about the greatest market ever, and this is mobile. So uh, PCs, that was a phenomenal market. It supported the rise of, um, of Microsoft and Intel, and that peaked at over 300 million uh, units sold. Uh, the smartphone is probably uh, is the most successful product ever made. Uh, it's it's at about a uh, 1.4 billion units sold right now, and so to the extent that we we want to be in great markets and we do, then being in the mobile market is 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 the place to be. So. Uh, by the way, if you look at this, uh, at the adoption of smartphones in the U.S., it follows this uh, this S curve. This is uh, an adapted. Uh, this is actually empirical data in the middle, and then you can sort of fit a mathematical S curve, and you can try to forecast when the saturation of of the smartphone market in the U.S. will happen. And w what happens with these S curves is that in the beginning. You have uh, you know these use cases that are kind of ridiculous, right? In the beginning, when the the flip phone came out, you sort of like, well, what am I going to use this for? Maybe I'll check my email, and get, I guess I can see stock prices and the weather. And then, of course, as it gets more mature, you really get the killer apps, you know, ride sharing, Instagram, Instacart, the things that are enabled uniquely by mobile, and that you could never imagine at the beginning of the S curve. So, one company that is almost mobile native uh, that really thrives because of this amazing mobile market is Facebook. And this is a stacked view of all the users on Facebook since uh, 2010. And so in dark blue is North America, about 239 million uh, monthly active users. Europe, 370 million. Um, uh, rest of the world, 692 million. In Asia, 828 million. Uh, monthly active users. So uh, right now, daily active users, Facebook has about 1.4 billion and 2.1 billion monthly active users. Just phenomenal growth. What's interesting is on top of that, on top of those users, uh, of course, Facebook sells advertising in the news feed. And as it learned and as it pivoted from desktop to mobile, it was really able to monetize this well. This is a, a chart showing the quarterly average um, uh, revenue per, per user. And in North America, it was, it was Facebook was earning about $2.77 per user in 2010. And in the rest of the world, it was 46 cents. And look what happens as Facebook figures out how to sell advertising and, uh, uh, and how to improve its product. And as there's more adoption and more shift of dollars onto onto the Facebook platform. So uh, last quarter, it sold almost $27. It, it made almost $27 per user in North America. So there's an enormous spread here. And part of this is because, of course, the, the best advertising market is North America, the wealthiest market. But there's probably a lot of room to go in other parts of the world. And of course, this is a sort of a toll booth on GDP. As GDP rises, advertising revenues will rise as well. And as uh, smartphone penetration increases and broadband penetration increases, and there's more shift of, uh, of advertising dollars from uh, offline or traditional print and TV channels onto Facebook, uh, this company is a prime beneficiary of all those trends. We can look at the advertising industry. Uh, this goes back to 1980. And so in the dark gray is, is TV advertising dollars. Other includes things like um, out of home uh, and, and other traditional channels uh, like billboards, et cetera. Print is, uh, is uh, newspapers and magazines. And, uh, and by the way, other also includes radio here. Um, and then finally, of course, in, in orange there or brown is uh, is the Internet. So Facebook and Google are taking the lion's share of those dollars. It's almost like a duopoly in, in digital advertising. Um, so throughout this period, 
I mentioned uh, that that Facebook is uh, uniquely suited to mobile, but it didn't really start that way. In 2010, 97% of Facebook's advertising dollars came from desktop and only 3% came from mobile. And so this just shows incredible work by by the team at Facebook in, in pivoting. And today, the, the vast majority of, of uh, Facebook's uh, advertising dollars come from, from mobile. Now, there's also some hidden value here, which I think is interesting to point out. And again, this is sort of for fun because we're really not paying for it. But eBay has, um, as of uh, last year, had 170 million active buyers uh, on its platform. So these are people transacting on eBay, buying and selling things. And that number was up about 5% in 2017. eBay is worth about $48 billion in the stock market. Now, Facebook has 550 million uh, users transacting on its marketplace tab. Um, uh, this is, again, from 2.1 billion monthly active users or 1.4 billion daily active users. 550 million people are transacting, and that number tripled last year. Now, I don't know what this is worth, but it's interesting to think about what it could be worth as Facebook starts to monetize this property. Uh, and I'll also point out there are many other properties that Facebook will begin monetizing like video and WhatsApp and Messenger and Instagram. So again, uh, just comparing these two companies with traditional staples companies uh, is interesting. If you look at top line growth, and of course, top line growth is very important because it shows that you have you know, product market fit. It shows that you're, you are riding this uh, several adoption curves. Uh, the price to earning mul multiples are actually very low uh, when you consider the quality of these businesses and the runway that they have for growth. Now, if you compare these two, these traditional CPG companies, I picked uh, these two because they're very large and well-known, Nestle and Unilever. Uh, the multiples don't seem uh, don't seem that far off, and and the growth is practically non-existent. So my argument is that Facebook and Google are the new consumer uh, staples companies. These are the companies that own the consumer relationship. That are the, they are the franchises of today. They are loved by their customers. There are no close substitutes, and they have unregulated pricing. So um, uh, I, I think that these the companies on the left will have uh, a much brighter future than the companies on the right, on uh, given the current valuation and the growth rates and and their moats. So I, I like to talk about two more S curves that we're writing in the portfolio, and this is our third example. So these two S curves are e-commerce, the adoption of e-commerce, and and the cloud business. So um, Amazon is uh, is is writing both of these S curves and this is a, a chart of e-commerce adoption in the United States. So what I did here is I took census.gov data for retail sales in the US and I excluded gasoline and automotive automotive sales. So e-commerce is at about 13% of all retail sales in the US X gas and motor vehicle. Um, and you can sort of try to fit a, um, a logistic curve, which is an S-curve, on this and try to predict where this is going to go, although we don't really know what the shape of that S-curve is in the future. Um, Amazon has about 2.6% share of, of retail sales. Um, and um, what's interesting is Amazon has has a dominant strategy. Um, it, it Most companies have this trade-off where they, they have... Um, you know, if they have uh, a certain amount, a certain selection, they might have high prices because it's high touch, uh, or maybe they have a huge selection and low prices. There's they sort of live somewhere inside that semicircle. Um, Amazon, on the other hand, it can offer sort of the best of both worlds. It can have the the best selection and the lowest prices, and the best delivery time. So it, it really has this dominant strategy. And and if you think about the previous slide where it shows where we show the the how early we are in the adoption of e-commerce, uh, Amazon has just enormous runway ahead of it. 50% um, of all product searches start on amazon.com. So again, this is another uh, business that could grow a lot is the advertising business. Amazon is doing about six billion per year in advertising. Um, Google does eighty-five billion. Facebook does forty billion. So 
uh, again, this is a, a place where Amazon is going to start making more and more money and, and very high margin money at that. Alexa, which is the voice assistant, has a huge market share uh, for for the digital uh, uh, in, for people who do have digital assistants, and, and so this is another area of competitive advantage for for Amazon. Um, so, if we look at Amazon's revenues over over uh, over the years, it's just been growing at a very very healthy rate. Uh, again, riding that huge adoption curve, and here in light blue, this is North America, and dark is international. Uh, a lot of this is India. Amazon is spending a lot of money to to get into India and and build that business, and then I want to point out the green on the bottom, which is the Amazon Web Services, which is a cloud business. This is a uh, cash flow. Uh, there's this myth that Amazon isn't profitable. They are massively profitable. They just to choose to invest every nickel that they make into growth and into experiments. So Amazon ha it has a culture of experimentation and trying things out. And Jeff Bezos has said that at any point in time, they are running many, many experiments and he's very willing to uh, lose money for five to seven years in each one of those. And the pillars of the company like Prime and Amazon Web Services and um, uh, the new things that they're trying out like uh, Amazon Studios, Etc. Uh, and, and of course, marketplace is is one of their pillars as well. This idea of of having third parties selling on their platform and just getting a cut, which is a very high margin business. Most of these were ideas, if not all, were ideas that were that came to Jeff Bezos from um, engineers at Amazon. So Amazon has this culture where where people are empowered to come up with ideas and experiment and try things out, and, and that's what creates this incredible culture and the incredible growth of of the company. When I went to the Amazon Web Services Conference in Vegas in, in November of 2017, I did this workshop where you really, uh, you, you sort of really understand the process that Amazon uses to innovate. So what they do is they first write the press release for a, a fictitious product that they want to launch. And so they'll, they'll write the press release and they'll do sort of the FAQ uh, and so this is; these are all the consumer benefits, and that and that's because they have a, this obsession with the customer. And then they'll take that press release and the FAQ, and they will get these uh, small teams, and they will then build the product based on the idea of the press release of delighting the customer. If you open uh, Amazon's 10K, their mission statement is that they seek to be the Earth's most customer-centric company and that they're guided by four principles. Customer obsession rather than competitor focus. A passion for invention, commitment to operational excellence, and long-term thinking. So it's very hard to compete with a company that is guided by these principles, that can act on these principles, and that has this ability to invest so heavily in experiments and for the future. You know, Jeff Bezos wrote in 2015 that uh, Prime will keep getting more and more benefits added to it because he wants it to be such a good value that you'd be responsible uh, not to be a member. And again, three pillars, Prime Marketplace and Amazon Web Services and, uh, and, and counting. So one thing uh, that people don't uh, appreciate about Apple, about, sorry, Amazon is... Um, is that over the years, Amazon has taken each one of their of their line items of expense and has turned those things into new businesses uh, with uh, uh, that they open to third parties. So, for example, fulfillment. Now there's fulfillment by Amazon. Of course, technology became Amazon Web Services, Amazon Payments, etc. And there are new things now that have been created since 2015. And this is also uh, an incredible competitive advantage. Now, I want to focus a little bit on the cloud business. So cloud revenues uh, have been growing extraordinarily strongly. This is now a $20 billion run rate uh, business if you annualize the, the last quarter. And uh, the operating margins are very, very, very healthy here. So uh, this business is just extraordinary. And the best analogy that I can uh, think of to really explain what this business is, is it, it, when electricity was invented, uh, uh, every, um, every uh, uh, big company and, and industrial plant, uh, and, uh, every big manufacturer had their own electricity plant attached to the factory because there was no centralized electricity provider. 
and Samuel Insull, who was a clerk working under Thomas Edison at the Edison Electric Company, he saw this problem and he moved to Chicago and he started acquiring all these different power producers and centralizing them and then knocking on people's doors and saying, hey, instead of you running your own electric power plant and having uh, all this machinery and all this capital expense and having to maintain this, why don't you just plug into my network and buy electricity from me by the hour? And so what Amazon Web Services is doing is they're doing the same thing for compute, for computing power for the 21st century. So it's the same process of selling, whether it's databases, machine learning, storage, um, anything having to do with that compute S-curve, Amazon is selling to you by the hour, and they're making the, the products cheaper and better all the time. So when you go to Amazon Web Services, uh, the website, you can see all these different components. So for example, if you click on compute, you're gonna see uh, EC2, uh, you're gonna see Fargate, Lambda, all these different uh, components. If you go to database, you'll see Am uh, DynamoDB, which is Amazon's version of Oracle database, but hey, it's one-tenth the cost, and that's very disruptive, right? And so Amazon keeps adding these components Every month, every every few weeks, there are dozens of components coming out, and that gives them a tremendous uh, competitive advantage. Um, and, and by the way, Jeff Bezos says that usually when when Amazon starts a business, competitors come right after them after perhaps a couple years. With the cloud, they uh, when they started, people thought they were crazy, like this would never work, and so they got a seven year head start before anybody else started really chasing them uh, with any seriousness. So they just have a, a huge head start right now. Uh, the way, uh, the, the, the another analogy to think about this is that these are sort of Lego bricks for the 21st century. And what Amazon's goal is, is that engineers and, and businesses only worry about the business logic and that everything else having to do with the underlying technology is, is, uh, is Amazon's problem. So at the conference, I saw a lot of presenters. I saw presentations by companies like Viacom. Uh, Viacom had a great example where they, uh, they they were saying, look, you know, Viacom owns Nickelodeon, right? And they show uh, children's uh, cartoons. And it used to take somewhere between five and 15 days to get a data study. So who's watching Paw Patrol at 8 a.m. on a Sunday? It used to take five to 15 days to get that information, put it in a chart, uh, et cetera. Now, uh, after they put everything in the cloud, it takes less than one second. And the next step is going gonna, is gonna to be to build a, an Alexa skill so that you can literally just ask Alexa the question and she'll give you an answer uh, in under a second. So when companies understand this, that, that once they put their data on AWS, they have so much more that they can do with that data, slicing and dicing it and, and, and using machine learning against it and, and really enabling the entire organization to take advantage of it. Uh, this is going to be, this is just a, a, a tidal wave. So I saw presentations by Netflix, which runs all of its business, business on AWS, uh, Airbnb. Here is NASA. And NASA showed us their roadmap for all the satellite launches and how data is exploding. And by the way, this data explosion slide uh, just going like a hockey stick is something that all these companies showed. And once you have all your data on AWS, it becomes very sticky. So that's that's another source of moat. This is uh, from Goldman Sachs estimates of market share for 2019. Uh, AWS, this sort of looks similar today. AWS is the leader with 46%. Um, Microsoft, Azure, 22%. Google at 12%. Um, Probably nobody in the West is going to use Alibaba because of concerns uh, of the, with the Chinese government. And then the other clouds are more specialized. But uh, a word on, on Microsoft Azure, they have a big market share. But my understanding is that this is mostly because a lot of companies use Microsoft um, uh, software. And so the sort of the incumbent companies uh, are, are, mostly com are mostly in that, in that, in that slice. New companies and startups all seem to go to AWS. They have uh, the, the biggest developer community. And in fact, a lot of venture capitalists will give founders that they meet and that they back, they'll give them uh, Amazon gift cards so they can use on AWS. Uh, and then of course, the bottom slice is Google. And that's the business that I was telling you about that I also think is is gonna be, uh, I think, uh, you know, the cloud, it's just a massive multi, 
you know, perhaps at least one trillion dollar opportunity uh, for for all these companies to take advantage of. So it's going to be a very a very big uh, uh, growth industry. And if you have a structure with only three players, it'll probably oligopolistic, and and pricing will probably be rational. They'll have healthy margins. We'll see. Finally, one last thing about these companies is that they really are beloved by their customers. This is a survey of eighteen to thirty four year olds. And uh, what, are, what are sort of the, the top apps that they cannot live without? And it's it's these three. Everything is is by these three companies, with the exception of the Apple uh, App Store. So all the properties listed here is it's either Amazon, Facebook, or Google. So circling back to this idea, uh, remember, you know Ben Graham buys Geico, superior product. Uh, riding this incredible S curve of the automobile adoption, that is exactly what we're doing at Heller House with these companies, right? We are, uh, and if we look at the big picture in terms of worldwide broadband adoption and internet uh, user penetration, we're at only sort of halfway that S curve, halfway on that S curve of internet adoption around the world, and of course we're riding many other S curves as well. We have cloud adoption, we have machine learning and artificial intelligence and smartphones, etc. So we're executing on this framework. We're sort of buying the Geico's of the 21st century. I would argue much better than Geico's of the 21st century because these businesses are really uh, business models that never could have existed before taking advantage of, of the internet. So I, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about before we end, which is a business that we've owned for about three years, and the stock has uh, has more than doubled since we since we bought it. And this is Aina. This is the airports of Spain. Um, airports are a phenomenal business for obvious reasons. You have sort of a natural monopoly. You have a regulated part, which is air, airplanes taking off and landing, and you have. Uh, in some cases, unregulated, and Aina's case, unregulated commercial revenues, which is duty-free shopping, etc. And Aina owns every single airport in Spain. There is no concession risk. There's no time frame where they have to hand back the airports to the, to the state. This this is a freehold. They own all the airports. Uh, so really a phenomenal business, sort of like a toll booth on global growth because these are network businesses connected to the entire world. And if you look again at the S-curve of adoption, uh, if you will, looking at number of numbers of passengers that have flown over the years, uh, you almost can't see again a recession or a war. Uh, it's it's just a very robust rate of adoption. And what's interesting is it took about forty years to get that first one billion, uh, the first one billion uh, flyers. Um, and then it took only 20 years to, to get the second billion and 10 years to, to get the third billion. There's still a lot of growth ahead. Um, most of it is in, it's going to be in Southeast Asia. So we're, we're really interested in looking at those airports and looking at other airports that have uh, specific uh, dynamics that, 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 uh, that will spur growth and profitability. And so one thing that we've been toying with uh, is to create a fund that that is a single theme fund. It just like focuses on global airports. Uh, I don't I don't believe there's any other product like that out there. So this is something that I, I wanted to let our investors know that is something that we're thinking about doing. If if, if anybody has an interest, to please contact me. Uh, contact information is at the end of this uh, this uh, presentation. Some of our other current investments that uh, you you might remember if you've been reading our letters. Compagnie des Alpes is a uh, a French-based uh, Swiss, uh, sorry, French-based uh, skiing company. We've uh, done very well with ski resorts in the past with Whistler and Intra West in the U.S. We own Forterra, which is a brick company in the U.K. and Kexang. So these are these are all companies that have very good balance sheets, good management teams, uh, good valuations, etc. They are different from what we presented today, but I just wanted to point out that we. We have these uh, still. If uh, for those of you who have been reading our letters to investors, you know uh, we we continue to own and like these these businesses as well. Um, and finally, I just wanted to talk about a paradigm change that is probably happening, um, and that is this idea of uh, of decentralized money. Um, obviously, m most people have heard of Bitcoin at this point. Uh, it's a real phenomenon. It's a fundamental revolution in in uh, computer science. This ability to transact with an untrusted party and transact value, whether that's the transfer of a property or a uh, currency or a contract, without having any sort of, uh, of of centralized counterparty. So that's the fundamental revolution. 
uh, I'm dealing with an untrusted party without a counter, without a centralized counterpart. It's fully distributed. So uh, it, it's this has never been possible in the history of mankind, and it's enabled by the internet and by and by mathematics, frankly, uh, which is uh, uh, cr- cryptographic uh, innovations. So. And of course, in the beginning of the S-curve, if you remember our slide from the mobile market, you sort of get these simple use cases. Well, maybe uh, cryptocurrencies will disrupt banking, maybe title insurance, but we don't really know what the more mature uh, applications will be uh, and what the more interesting applications will be. But this is something that has the potential to disrupt a lot of industries, and so it's something that that, uh, we're keeping our eyes on. Um, this is kind of fun. Uh, from from last week, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase had its investor day, and the analyst says, "Hey, you know, Jamie, uh, the CEO, you you made a a funny comment about Bitcoin." And Jamie Dimon's like, "Well, you know, uh, they're sort of irrelevant to J.P. Morgan." But then, of course, if you open the annual report for J.P. Morgan, it says new competitors have emerged, and cryptocurrencies uh, might be a problem. So it's interesting to note, uh, you know, that that. The, the banks, uh, the bank, the heads of the banks might be saying this is not a problem, but uh, it, it probably will be a problem, and it might take ten or twenty years for this to come to fruition. But it's interesting to keep an eye on. Uh, finally, I wanted to point out that um, things are getting better. There's a lot of pessimism out there, and I, I hear this often. I was at a uh, a party recently, and there was a grandma and two moms around me, and they were talking about how what a bad idea it is to bring a child into this world because things are so awful. And I said, well, things have never been better. And they looked at me like I was insane. So I, I recommend this website called Our World in Data. And if you look through all the data sets in there, whether it's uh, child mortality going down, poverty going down, uh, life expectancy going up, wealth going up. Of course, you have to zoom out and look at the big picture. You're not going to be comparing today to yesterday or how you feel. It's more, this is sort of aggregate data. And it's very important to keep a broad perspective that things are getting better and that pessim- and that pessimism uh, really doesn't pay over time. In fact, if you look at the stock market, there's always been uh, a smart reason to sell. Right. There's always been uh, some war, some invasion, some uh, there's always something happening. And in the meantime, for for those uh, people, for, for those who uh, don't really pay attention to the news, uh, they've made 100 times their money after inflation since 1950. So uh, it's important to to keep that in mind and not worry about the day to day ups and downs. And, and, you know, people who are thinking about waiting for something to happen before they invest. It's kind of like saving sex for old age, frankly. I mean, you know, if you're going to invest, you might as well just invest because you're capturing a piece of that enormous wealth creation enabled by all these S-curves and these incredible businesses with very strong moats that we discussed in this presentation. So if you'd like to become an investor in the fund, a partner, uh, please visit hellerhs.com slash invest. And I can frequently be found on Twitter just thinking out loud and thinking about where the world is going. So if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Marcelo P. Lima. Um, and uh, I'm also working on setting up a blog so that uh, I can sort of share more ideas and thoughts uh, with everyone and, and stay in touch. So um, and that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much.